I'm Colin Chisholm, Staff Sergeant, Calgary Police Homicide Unit. The investigation into the murder of Nadia El Dib is considered concluded. As there will not be any court proceedings, we are able to release the following details at the request of Nadia's family. Investigators have determined that Abdir Hamin Betahar, also known as Adam Betahar, legally purchased a semi-automatic rifle on March the 10th, 2018. On Sunday, March 25th, police believe Betahar and Nadia left a downtown shisha bar together at approximately 3 a.m. Around 4 a.m., Nadia contacted a friend to express her frustration that Betahar refused to turn her, refused to return her to her vehicle, which was parked near the shisha bar. At approximately 4.15 a.m., Betahar parked the vehicle they were in behind a home in the 1000 block of Maitland Drive Northeast. Shortly after, while still in the vehicle, Betahar stabbed Nadia approximately 40 times and cut her throat. Despite Nadia's injuries, Nadia escaped the vehicle before being shot by Betahar and falling to the ground in a nearby backyard. Video evidence collected during the investigation shows two muzzle flashes were subsequently fired. Forensic evidence at the scene is consistent with Nadia being down on the ground when the second shot was fired. Although witnesses later reported hearing gunshots, police were called, were not called until 9.30 a.m. for a report that a body had been found. Police believe that Nadia and Betahar had previously had been previously seeing each other <coughs> in late 2017. However, they were not in a relationship at the time of the homicide. This is considered a domestic homicide. Police had no prior involvement with Nadia or B and Betahar before the night of the murder. Domestic violence is a real problem in our community and it crosses all neighborhoods, age groups, ethnicities, religions, and sh economic statuses. In total, police were called to 18,528 domestic conflict calls last year, a 6% increase over the five-year average. The, ma the vast majority of these calls are verbal altercations that escalated to the point that police were called, or situations where one party has asked police to be present while they moved out of their home due to domestic conflict. In 2017, 4,973 domestic calls were classified as domestic violence because they involved some form of physical violence. This is a 45% increase over the five-year average. While the majority of domestic conflict victims are women, approximately one in five are men. The Calgary Police Service Domestic Conflict Unit works closely with partner agencies to intervene in families experiencing frequent domestic conflict. We encourage anyone that is experiencing abuse or violence in a domestic relationship to reach out for help. There are countless agencies ready to offer support that can be contacted by calling Connect Family and Social Abuse Network at 403-237-5888 toll free at 1-877-237-5888, the 24-hour family violence helpline at 403-234-SAFE, that's 403-234-7233, or by calling 211. If anyone is in immediate danger, call 911. I can answer any questions and also have uh, Staff Sergeant Paul Wozni of the Domestic Conflict Unit here as well. Paul, any idea, or Colin, sorry, any idea on um, why he was in Northwest Alberta or where he was heading when the RCMP caught up with him? Um, we don't have any idea, and we can't discuss any of the details of that part of the investigation. That's an ACER investigation. From uh, the, the video surveillance you mentioned, where, where was that gathered from? That was gathered from a residence, a nearby residence. You said he obtained his gun legally on the 10th of March? 
That's that's correct. But it's a uh, so he was uh, he was transporting it illegally. Obviously, this is much as ready. Well, on, on the day of uh, the homicide, obviously he had transported it illegally. illegally. So, it, so it was a restricted firearm. It was a not a restricted firearm. It's a rifle, semi-automatic rifle. How difficult does it make the case? Like, do you have him conclusively on CCTV footage, or like, how difficult does it make the case? Because obviously. Like you said, there is no trial and no possible conviction here. Based on all the evidence we have, we are uh, totally confident that Mr. Bedahar is responsible for Nadia's murder. Can you talk about the rifle, the make, the caliber? Uh, it was a, it was a uh, high-powered rifle. Yeah. I believe it was, yeah. I can't remember, I believe it was, yeah. Seven six two, similar to a three oh eight. I don't know. So, could you just readdress why it was transported illegally? I didn't catch that. It was illegal to, for him to be carrying it that day. No, you can't. Uh, yeah, I won't get into the details on uh, transporting firearms. Obviously, he had it loaded, so to have it there in that situation, um, yeah. When you transport a firearm from one place to another. From a home to a firing range, it's got to be in a locked case, etc. It can't be loaded, that type of thing. Any other questions? Paula? Oh. Do you have a question Paul? Yes. Yeah. So this is Staff Sergeant Paul Wozni. Paul, can you show spell your name? Yeah, it's uh, Paul Wozni, spelled W O Z N E Y. In terms of this being classified a domestic homicide, this, we've been talking about in the news for years now about how we have a domestic abuse or a domestic problem here in this city. Is it getting any better? Well, I think that um, as Staff Sergeant Chisholm had indicated, the numbers are going up. Um, when we base our numbers on five-year averages and our numbers are going up 6%, 10% a year, um, that in itself is, uh, is alarming. Um, even the number of 18,000 plus domestics a year um, a portion of those, what we would deem as to be domestic violence, and a portion of which are um, arguments, enough for the police to certainly be called. Um, 18,000 a year, if you do the math on a daily basis, those numbers in itself are also um, what I would call significant and alarming. So um, there, are, there are numerous social agencies uh, that we partner with uh, to try to address these issues. Um, um, none of these issues is taken lightly by the police or by these social these social agencies, and uh, we really want to encourage um, anyone who's a, a victim of domestic violence to please come forward. Uh, please make yourself available um, uh, to come in to either talk to the police, uh, talk to the, uh, either our patrol members, and if it um, gets up into that, I guess the, I guess that higher echelon uh, of a of an of, a, of an event, then uh, the domestic conflict unit. Uh, uh, it, will, it will come across our radar, and, the, and my investigators will go out and investigate that. Do um, at the CPS have numbers about how many of these domestic incidents result in fatalities, and is that a problem that's on the rise? Yeah, we have, um, I don't have the numbers handy today in terms of domestic-related homicide, but I can tell you that um, uh, the work that has gone on through social agencies, through the domestic conflict unit, and overall the philosophy of the Calgary Police Service, we have seen those numbers drop significantly from um, uh, at one point 15, 18 years ago, half of, uh, typically half of our domestic homicides would be domestic related. Um, and now we're seeing, um, uh, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we are seeing um, three or five a year, which unfortunately um, are deemed domestic related homicides. So the numbers are trending down, um, but uh, our target, our target number is zero. Now people often get caught in sort of a, a cycle um, where sometimes they're afraid to, you know, to report it to even get the ball rolling. I mean, what sort of advice would you have to someone who may be seeing this and, uh, and is thinking that this relates to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's two parts to that question. Uh, the first part is that uh, um, there are people out in the community that want to help. So if people feel alone or they feel isolated, they feel like they're on an island. Um, there are um, networks and networks of agencies available to assist. And the other part of that, uh, the other answer to that question is, 
um, as a friend, as a family member, um, as a neighbor, if you're noticing or if you think something is, is, is amiss, um, often our gut feeling is, is, uh, is accurate. And I would encourage those people um, to, uh, to keep an eye on their neighbors, to keep an eye on, um, on, uh, on um, what may be going on in, in their neighbor's household or their family's household. And they can also report to these agencies as well. They can report to the Calgary Police Service and, um, and, uh, and we treat all of that very, very seriously as well. So it's not just the victims, it's also the, the family and the friends that uh, we also want to uh, um, uh, ensure are part of that, um, uh, uh, part of the solution to these issues as well. Just to be clear, I mean, in terms of at what point do you get involved? I mean, there's people who presumably heard the gun that night that maybe never called the CPS. If you're, you're hoping or you're encouraging people who might see or hear anything suspicious or fear for people to call, I mean, it's worth police looking into. Sure. M many of, the, of our, um, our 18,000 um, domestic calls that we get a year, a good, good portion of those come from neighbors calling, come from somebody's out walking a dog and they hear a, a, a glass breaking and uh, an, ar an arguing going on in a, in a kitchen, through a kitchen window. They call the police. Um, yeah, th this, uh, this goes back to the last question is, it isn't just about the victim feeling alone or feeling as though they're isolated, is that we need to be, get everybody en engaged. This is a community problem. This isn't a problem just for one household on a street. This actually is a community problem and we need to be engaged as a community to, to help address it. What can we do when there aren't as many clear signs? I mean, based on your information from police today, this man wasn't known to police. It seems to escalate really quickly to such a brutal end. Um, do you have any advice for us in those situations? I, I can't comment on uh, Staff Sergeant Chisholm's investigation because I don't have any knowledge of it um, other than what I've read in the media. But uh, again, I think that the message has to be um, repeated again and again um, that there are resources available in the community. If people feel alone, if they feel isolated, um, that there, there are the resources available for them and they aren't alone. Um, they may feel that way, but we want to get the message out that they aren't alone and that uh, uh, there's a battery of of resources for us to help, for, for us to provide help for them. Any other questions? Um, what are some, uh, obviously there's uh, two sides of this, so what were people who were feeling like they're, uh, they might be committing something like this? Obviously if you feel like you're being stressed out on the one side, if you are the abuser, what avenues do they have? Um, there's also support, there, again, if uh, so the numbers that Staff Sergeant Chisholm had mentioned and obviously online, um, a, a very quick Google search will provide any, uh, any variety of social agencies that are willing to step up to assist. Um, we speak all the time of, you make a good point, we speak all the time speaking specifically to the victims and, and, and really the victims are, are, are our center of attention. But if somebody does feel like they have anger management issues, they feel as though they're having difficulty coping, they have addictions issues, um, maybe they came from a household or a family history where um, they watched their father um, commit uh, assaults upon their mother, um, those sort of things, there's that, there's that, um, that history to it. Um, again, there's agencies available, um, there's, um, there's just no different than how they have uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, there's groups that meet for men uh, to get together. I don't have those at the tip of my tongue now, but those, those resources are certainly available as well um, on both sides of the fence. Great. Yeah. I want to thank you all for being here today. My family would like to especially thank the Calgary Police Service who have been instrumental in investigating this tragedy, as well as the RCMP officers, which we had the pleasure of meeting on Monday, that were also very invested. I would also like to acknowledge the media for being respectful towards myself and my family, as well as helping us share Nadia's story. To everyone who has reached out, whether you know Nadia, my family, or neither, I also want to thank you and to let you know that you have touched us deeply, and we are very grateful for the support that we have received. 
With the help of those who have surrounded us, we have found strength and we know that we will get through this very challenging time. On Sunday, March 25th, 2018, a life was taken away too soon. My best friend and sister, at the hands of a disturbed young man who believed he had the right to murder her because she chose to exercise her right of taking ownership of her life, body and soul by saying no to a man who was persistent on being with her. My sister Nadia made it clear that she would not give herself to him in any way. We know that because she fought until her last breath to get away from Abdurrahman Adam Batahar. From further discussion with the Calgary Police Service, there was sufficient evidence to charge Adam with first degree murder because of his premeditated motivation to take away my sister's life. He had legally purchased a semi-automatic assault rifle on March 10, 2018. And on March 25th, Adam was seen on camera returning home around 2 a.m. to pick up the assault rifle as well as a knife. He then picked up my sister and refused to take her back to her vehicle like she had asked. This we know because of a phone call made to a friend just minutes before Adam took her life. When he pulled up to his house the second time shortly after 4 a.m., my sister Nadia was stabbed around 40 times by Adam and it was made evident that she had defended herself due to defensive wounds that were present on her hands, which is when she made her escape from the vehicle. This is when Adam got out of his car, retrieved the rifle, and shot my sister for the first time, from which she fell to the ground. He then fired a second and final shot while he stood on top of her on the side of her head. That shot ended her life. The CPS investigation determined that Adam acted alone in the murder of Nadia and that it was premeditated. Adam fled alone to Northern Alberta where he was on the run for five days. He attempted to flee from the RCMP officers in a dangerous high-speed chase and engage in a shooting in a shootout on the 29th of March. In doing so, he put in danger the lives of multiple RCMP officers. The investigation done by the CPS shows that there was no indication of drugs or alcohol influencing Adam's actions and that he acted on his own accord. He and he alone was the cause of Nadia's death. There was no third party involvement in this incident. I am here to make a few things clear in regards to my sister's death. Adam acted alone on this, and his anger towards my sister and her refusal to be with him was made evident when he decided to stab her approximately 40 times, and more so when he decided to kill her. This is a case of domestic violence, and the sole reason for my presence here today is to speak for Nadia so that she doesn't become another nameless statistic. She was a strong young, young woman who fought and refused a man, and that decision alone resulted in her death. Women live in fear for their lives every day of the repercussions of refreezing a man. We are taught to give fake numbers, to use the excuses of already having a significant other, and other methods to refuse a man in case no just doesn't mean no. These methods are too often not enough to get a man to leave you alone or even to avoid being subject to domestic violence. As women in our society, we are too often told to carry a whistle by our parents or by our friends so that we may protect ourselves. I am here to use Nadia's voice to give strength to those who have been in similar situations, to those who are in mentally, physically, or emotionally abusive situations, so that they can find the strength to reach out. Even if it's not to someone you know, reach out to anybody to find that courage and seek help. My sister's story has hit close to home for a lot of people. The pain and loss has been felt by everyone, and this has deeply hurt people because of the thought that this could have been any girl. This could have been anybody's sister, friend, mother, daughter. But unfortunately this time, it was my sister, Nadia, and I will use her name and voice to fight and support those who haven't quite found that strength. Adam has broken our family. There will forever be something missing in our lives. He has hurt us, as well as everyone touched by the story. But we want to turn this around and make a bigger impact on society, one that will help others. This is also a message to friends and family to open your minds and hearts to those who do reach out to you and to see the signs in your own family or your friends' relationships so that their story doesn't end like Nadia's. On a final note, I just want to say how proud I am to be a part of the LDIP family, to have been raised by parents who told us and encouraged us to be strong, to fight in what we believe in. That was evident to Nadia because she went down fighting. She fought in what she stood for. My family has been so strong through a tragedy that is everyone's nightmare, but they have been so amazing and I am so proud of them. I will use the strength that, that, I, that they have given me to fight in what I believe in. I am so proud of, of Nadia. She's an example of, an, of how in order to leave your mark in this world is to be kind, to help those in need, and to have a good heart. She was the definition of happiness and a person full of life and laughter. Her goal was to bring out the happiness and confidence of those around her, and based on what people have told me and for myself, I can say that that is what she has done. She has accomplished at the age of 22 what I can only hope to do in my lifetime. I can only wish to be half the person that she is. 
I would give anything up for her to still be here today. To be here to celebrate my birthday this weekend, my upcoming graduation. And it breaks my heart that she won't be here anymore to celebrate these milestones in my life. I know that her spirit will live on because of her strength. The strength that she had, she has now given to me, which is helping me get through this and speak on her behalf. Her story and her legacy will live on forever. She is the reason I will be able to continue fighting for what I believe in. Nadia has always said that she looks up to us, my parents, myself, and my sisters. But I can say that we look up to her in admiration and awe, and that she will forever be my hero. <sighs> Uh, the strength, um, just through our, the support from our community, um, the Druze community within Calgary and all over the world, um, from every race, ethnicity, religion, everybody has reached out to us, uh, our close friends and people we don't even know have just been so supportive through all of this and we haven't been alone. We're not alone because of the impact that we have seen in our community and people and the realization that this is happening, that women still live in this fear, and that this could have anybody that you know or that you don't know. So just them reaching out to us has helped us so much, and the support has been amazing for my family and for myself. You've been so brave, Rashi, in your words. I know we talked about this before. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, your activism in this part, yeah. your family's activism with domestic violence, what do you think your sister would make? My sister, um, just hearing stories from friends who have reached out to us that did know her, and we found out that Nadia was that person that would tell women to get out of these toxic relationships, to get out of situations that could have resulted in what happened to her. And uh, she was just such a strong woman. She, she was strong throughout her whole life, and that's a reflection of my parents and, my, and that scene in my siblings, because we're very strong as well. And she would be so proud. I can feel her. and. She's kind of like passed on this strength to me. And that's, I think, what's getting me through this. Yeah. It sounds like you're going to carry on with this fight. Of course. Of course. I will. I think the biggest discussion that we need to have in regards to the fight is people around you. Um, what is and isn't really um, okay in regards to a pursuit from a man or even a woman, in regards to toxic behavior, in regards to something that is controlling that you don't know if it's controlling or not, but the friends and family around you should be able to notice these signs and red flags and to tell you that this is not okay, this is okay, or that you should look for help or that things are a little, becoming a little bit dangerous. Uh, so that's kind of what our fight is for as well. Yeah. So uh, hearing this story, you yeah. know, what, what, what do you hope that you know, the 18,000 plus people yeah. on the other end of these calls, you know, what, what, what do you hope that they take and learn from this track? I hope that they do learn um, to reach out and as not just to, even if it's not to somebody you know, just reach out to anybody that's willing to listen to go, to go to those support groups. There's lots of support groups that we've even been told about in regards to homicide and domestic violence, that there, is, that there are things out there. And I know that people are in fear of being labeled as a victim, especially when, if you do come out as a domestic violence um, victim, uh, whether it results in a death or not, but you don't want that label and so I think that's also why people don't want to come out to friends and family so I think it's important to reach out to outside sources so that you know you're not alone because in any kind of situation you feel like it's all in your head but when you reach out to somebody who doesn't know you and they kind of reassure you that what you're thinking is okay and that things are dangerous or not then I think that's really important for you to take action yeah any other questions thank you, thank you guys Thanks very much. And I just want to acknowledge um, the courage and strength of Russia and the Aldib family for um, the stand that they're taking against domestic violence. I really have a lot of admiration for you. And like many others, I was horrified when I learned about the violent killing of Nadia Aldib. Once every six days in Canada, a woman dies at the hands of a domestic partner. Our thoughts are with the Aldib family who are living with unimaginable pain and I'm here to support Nadia's sister and family in their condemnation of this senseless act of violence. I am so sorry for your loss. 
Our society needs to continue to dispel the myth that a victim of domestic violence can prevent the violence. No matter what a woman wears, or says, or where she is, or how she acts, she is never responsible for the violence committed against her. Nadia was in no way responsible for her death. We cannot simply legislate domestic violence away. If you know a woman who you suspect is experiencing domestic violence, reach out. Urge her to contact support organizations that can help her out of the situation that she's in. And you can always dial 211 for referrals. If you know a woman is experiencing domestic violence, contact the police. I want to thank the CPS for their diligent work on this case. Domestic violence grows in the dark. By talking about it, we can shed light on this insidious problem and help end it. Thank you.